So I want to welcome everyone today to Nesquin Citizens Informational Town Hall on understanding Nesquin's drinking water supply and the opportunity we have for increased reliability. We have a lot of material today, so I'm going to get right into it. There we go. Um, so today's presenters, here is a list. I'm not going to introduce them all now because we have a lot of material to get through. What I'm gonna ask instead is as they come up in the agenda, they will do a brief self introduction. So um, I'm, I'm actually put myself at the end. So I'll say two, two sentences about myself, but Alex, you'll be up first and then Guy, because those slides are yours first. So as the presenters come up, I'll ask you to share a couple, um, a brief introduction about yourself and why you're here today and then launch into what you came to share with us. That way the presenter can be as close to the material as, um, as they can be and we can try to get through this quickly. So just to get through me, um, my name is Brenda Freshman. I've been uh, the informational town hall coordinator for you know, over 18 months. So I've, you've seen me around. Um, in today's session, I also wear um, an additional hat. I'm a Nesquim, Nesquim Regional Water District Board member. So those are my roles here today. And without um, further ado, I'm going to, um, well, from, I'm going to go over today's agenda and then I'm going to turn it over to Alex who has the first slide. So the first section is on the watershed acquisition for the Nesquim Regional Water District. So that's the basic um, why we're interested in doing this. Uh, what it is, what is a watershed acquisition, and then how does that get achieved? So that's going to be the bulk of our presentation today. We have a lot of excellent subject matter experts, people with experience, our partners on this are here today to speak with us. Uh, because um, this is not, it is quite complicated, and we want to learn from those who have gone before, we have invited people, um, two folks from Arch Cape Water District Acquisition who've also worked with our partners. And we're, we're in section B, we've asked them to come here and share their story and their lessons learned. And then finally in section C, um, that's when we will open it up to questions from the community. So without further ado, um, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Uh, and now we know why we ask people to mute. Yes. <laughs> Brenda, did we get ahead on the slides? We did. And I can't hear you, Brenda. I apologize, that's not the right slide. Um, hold on, I'm gonna go back. There, this is your slide, correct? The compelling story. Alex and Guy, this is your slide? Right. There you go. Why? So I'll, I'll, I'm gonna start off and talk a little bit about um, why it's important uh, to be doing this. And, uh, and then Alex is gonna talk a little bit uh about uh the actual uh watershed itself uh and and why and he's going to be showing you a map and why we have uh concerns so uh again my name is guy sievert and along with alex uh sifford uh we are partners and uh just a small little consulting group uh e-system services um started out about 15 years ago uh working with uh, different agencies uh, and municipalities about healthy watersheds. Uh, and then recently in the last uh, five, six years, really focused on source uh, drinking water protection uh, and, and the importance and value of watersheds uh, in district water districts that depend on surface water. So, uh, and it just so happens we live in Nesquin. Uh, which is a real bonus. Uh, so we concern, we we're obviously very concerned about our own drinking water. So there's a couple of things that uh, you're going to hear throughout tonight. And I think as we move in the future, uh, one thing, that, uh, one term 
that you have to keep in mind is the source water area. You'll see it referred to often as SWA. Uh, and this is the area within our watershed that, that it's the drainage area where all of our drinking water comes from. So it's everything above the intake pipe from the water, uh, uh, water plant. Uh, so when you hear that reference source water area, uh, that's what we're referring to. This is where our drinking water comes from. Uh, and also want you to remember throughout this presentation, and it's also as we move forward and discussing this as a community, we're talking about water quality, yes, and also quantity. And you're going to see as we talk about differences about how land is managed, how both quality and quantity are impacted. So our current source water area is almost all managed for timber production. Nothing wrong with that. It's great. We've got plantations up uh, in the Hawk Creek watershed, uh, but it's not managed for protecting drinking water. Uh, yes, there are some regulations that the timber, uh, industrial timber folks have to follow, uh, but they don't involve really the protection of drinking water. So what we're talking about uh, in this presentation and as we move forward is that we want to change that. We want the, those lands that are in our source water area to be managed to protect our drinking water as much as possible. So what are the differences? One thing and those who who certainly uh, live here and visit here uh, know that you'll see, as you look up the Hawk Creek watershed, you'll see clear cuts periodically and much of the land has been recently clear cut. So when you have uh, uh, a, really a plantation, uh, all the age, even age growth, you clear cut every 35, 40 years, um, the issue then is, of course, that you know, trees absorb water at different rates at different ages. Uh, and when you do that, and once you clear cut, you've got bare ground, uh, they're gonna be spraying, which is another issue. Uh, you know, they don't like competing growth up there when they up, go up and replant those plantations. And so you have an uneven absorption of water into the ground. Uh, that impacts actually the flows of water uh, into the uh, uh, to the intake at the water plant. So at times after clear cut, you may have increased flows as trees grow up, they absorb water all at the same rate. And so you have this kind of steady uh, decrease in water and then all of a sudden an increase. What we're talking about is managing it uh, in terms of, uh, and having a, a, a staggered growth uh, more of a natural forest, uh, some people call it late successional forest, where uh, you will be absorbing naturally waters up in the upper watershed uh, and a more even, uh, even path. You're also uh, not, uh, uh, landslides and, and things are, are very much of a risk. Uh, we have had landslides in our watershed before. It has blocked the, uh, uh, our source water uh, temporarily. Uh, some of that's been caused by logging on the hillsides, steep hillsides. That is something that if you manage it for protecting the drinking water, you would not to, you would avoid any potential landslide if possible. Uh, the use of roads. Uh, one of the things that uh, that has been found in research is that logging roads produce a lot of runoff into water uh, and uh, into drinking water. Uh, and if you can uh, manage those roads in a way, uh, limit access, not having big trucks going up and down uh, those roads, or at least less likely to have that, um, then you're uh, also kind of avoiding one of the dangers to your drinking water. And of course, spraying, as you know, it's a big issue um, uh, all over the state. Uh, and when we're spraying, uh, which the for timber production, it works. You don't wanna have a lot of competing growth. So they're gonna have herbicides, pesticides, 
other kinds of spraying that happen, especially in the beginning when the first planting. So all these things can be changed by managing the lands differently. It doesn't mean also that there may not be selective logging, uh, but it does mean that you're gonna, you'll have a much more natural forest. Uh, you'll encourage beavers who are great engineers and having store water, uh, other uh, undergrowth, uh, other things that will help uh, the natural development of our watershed, uh, help even our flows, help protect the quality uh, of our water. I think the other thing I just want to say that we should keep in mind as we move forward is the impact of climate change. Whatever you may think about what causes climate change is really irrelevant here. Our climate is changing. Fiction for the Oregon coast and for this area is longer, hotter, drier summers, uh, shorter, wetter winters. Uh, the prediction is that we're still going to get our 100 inches of rain every year in Nescoin. We're just going to get it over a shorter period of time. But we depend on rain for drinking water. So we have to, uh, that is something we can't control. Uh, but we have to do everything we can otherwise, like manage our own watershed to uh, combat the changes that climate change are bringing. And this is, you know, Nesco is not unique. Uh, you'll hear from Arch Cape uh, a little later. But a lot of water districts, especially on the Oregon coast, uh, their drinking water comes from very small, uh, uh, off of, of uh, coast range uh, land that's managed for industrial timber because we have great, it's, it's great to grow trees here, as you all know. Uh, and so we're not alone in this. And other water districts are looking at other ways to do this too. And Alex and I have talk to a number of uh, coastal communities about their options on this. So uh, we're not alone. Uh, it is something that is unique. Uh, DEQ and their 2016 source water area assessment for Nesquin stated in their recommendation, owner control your area. It's not that large. It's being heavily harvested for timber Think about how you can manage it to protect your drinking water. Alex? Well, that's it for the evening, folks. Any questions? <laughs> you got to go through the map, Alex. Uh, no, here, we'll just follow the slides here for the moment. So, uh, uh, guys, explain the issues. Uh, I, I would say that for folks uh, on, the, on the call, that at any time, don't be afraid to go look at the uh, Nesco and Regional Water District's website and see some of the material that we're talking about tonight. Um, but it's I, I start with that because this is something that the district has been considering for a while. And, and we've got a little more detail on that farther down the road. But this is not something that just popped up in the last year. Um, also, we have a, a great examples of other communities, uh, municipal, typically municipal city water systems where they've owned their water supply area for quite some time, decades, in fact, in the case of uh, folks such as uh, Forest Grove, uh, McMinnville. Um, in any event, it's not just the coast and it's not just uh, a recent issue. It's the, an ideal long-term way to manage your surface or groundwater supplies if you own the lands where either the creeks supply the water or wells, which we don't have here, so we're entirely dependent on Hawk Creek for our water supply. Uh, and as Guy mentioned, e even if going forward, we still get 100 inches a year uh, of rain. If we no longer get it in the form of, let's say, 10 inches of snow this time of year in the uppermost part of the basin, which is a very nice way to get precipitation, uh, but instead we get another 10 inch storm like in April, um, it's all the more reason for us to say, well, how we manage the land will help manage how the water actually percolates into the ground and continues to supply us, um, especially in the fall time of year when our creeks are very low and there's still lots of folks in town using the water. So um, trying to even out the seasonality of water supply along with maintaining good water quality is again, one of the main reasons that, that we're, we're pursuing this. And again, 
acquisition is just one option, but it's also one that has the most control. Uh, uh, many times you're gonna hear people speak of conservation easements, and they are certainly a tool in the toolbox, um, but they lend themselves to large pieces of property uh, and uh, come with their own sets of challenges. So acquisition is, is a fairly straightforward, easy way, uh, if it at all is achievable. Um, and the good news is it's appearing to be much more achievable um, very soon and in the near term here in, in, uh, in Nesquim. So, um, and one last thing, uh, just on the general side of it is the, the idea that we're still gonna continue uh, harvesting timber uh, no one is saying that to buy this land uh, or these lands and then just lock them up and not do anything with them. In fact, there's ways to manage them to improve the water supply and water quality that still involve uh, small cuts of uh, timber harvesting, expanding riparian buffers, um, again, a number of other options in the way of, of harvesting timber that don't necessarily include clear cutting uh, right to the property. So that would end my suggestion on this slide to our moderator, Brenda. <laughs> okay, um, John, did you wanna say anything here about um, acquisition and introduce yourself or did you wanna wait till later? Cause I had you here to, to start introducing yourself. John Wickersham. Introduce myself real quick right now and then wait for a couple slides to do the acquisition talk. But good evening, everybody. My name is John Wickersham. I'm the associate director with North Coast Land Conservancy, and just a few quick words about North Coast Land Conservancy is we're based in Seaside. We're your local land trust. Our service area is from the Columbia River to Siletz Bay to the tips, from the tips of the coast range into the ocean. And we're just really excited to be here and to be of service to the, to the water district and the community to look at ways to potentially protect the drinking watershed. There's going to be more, a lot more from John later. Um, I guess I can say that one of the one of his roles in this is I I think we could call you our acquisition partner. And so we'll describe more later what that is about. Um, the next slide I'd like to call Troy up, our general manager of the water district, um, to describe the map and then the drone footage. So Troy, are you there? And I'll put up the map and then let me know when you maybe say a few words about this or if anyone else wants to say about the map and then I'll, I'll hit play on the drone footage um, when you guys are ready. You there, Troy? Yes. Does everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Maybe a brief introduction mm -hmm. for those who don't know you. Okay, uh, my name's Troy Truth. I'm the general manager of the Nesquin Regional Water District. Um, and I would be the person at your water plant that keeps things running. Um, I would be that little dot on that map that you see. And I specifically went up to the water plant tonight because it seemed apropos. Uh, so on the map that you see in front of you, I could uh, show you, I, I'm at the water plant. It's in the leftmost area of the really weird drawn circle, which is the outer boundary of our source water area. Uh, so the map you're looking at shows ownership of the lots. Yeah, that's me right there. Um, it, it, the map you're looking at shows the, the outline of the source water area over basically the lot lines and the ownership of the lots. Um, yes. So to give you a better idea of what we're talking about in the watershed, the first thing that you'll notice is a lot of that map was logged already. Um, there's a lot of clear cut in our watershed. Um, yeah, uh, Weyerhaeuser, well, it used to be uh, Hancock. And then I'm sure it was quite a few industrial timber harvesters before that owned these um, lands. 
and they did exactly what they should do to keep money flowing for their investors, which is cut the forest. Um, we do have a little bit of US Forest Service in the lower left hand corner. And we have some moderate aged um, stands of trees around our water plant. Um, but other than that, pretty much clear cut at this point. Um, on to the next one, I guess. Is oh, is that, I'm going to start rolling the drone footage then, because I want to be yeah, roll, to the drone part. Roll that drone footage. So, so take, I have to stop share and then reshare. So hold on. Sure. It's worth seeing. Right. Uh, I was just going to explain, um, you know, the Hawk Creek watershed is a fairly defined area, which is kind of nice. Uh, it makes it reasonable to do what we're trying to do. We're, we're not referring to 100,000 acres of the west side of a Cascade mountain. We're, we're a very specific geographical area. Ooh, nice. Oh, there we go. All right. Yeah, would anyone else like to say anything about the watershed while we're watching the drone footage? Um, we I'd like us to, to see a few minutes of this, <laughs> Alex. <laughs> sure. Um, what we just saw there was the, uh, what formerly oh. the Hawk Creek uh, golf course, which would, you would call very much the lowest portion of the watershed. Um, and because it is downstream of the water treatment plant, um, it's of less interest to the water district in terms of management for obvious reasons. So the focus is again on the water uh, watershed of Hawk Creek that is above the water treatment plant. So it's not it's not 100% of it, and that's fine. Um, as Troy pointed out, uh, the bulk of it has been in uh, what you would call industrial forestry. And here's the water treatment plant coming into focus, I believe, right, Troy? Right. I'm waving in spirit right there. Right by there that you window. go. That's me. So that modest facility provides one heck of a lot of very good quality water to us. There's a fish ladder on the left as we're going by here on the creek. That was a restoration project undertaken by the water district uh, over a dozen years ago or so. Uh, and then from here, you're moving upstream into the more heavily forested portions of the watershed. And again, the bulk of this land is zoned for forestry. So it's zoned for the forest management practices that, that Troy was discussing when we were looking at the map. Um, and it is most efficient to do clear cutting. So it's not, not uncommon. What you'll also notice here is the drone is following um, what are alders, the white trees that are along the creek, the Hawk Creek, uh, riparian corridor. So that's just typically what grows up along the corridor, number one. And number two, they don't typically harvest. They have some limits, existing limits on timber harvesting. So you can see the green trees, the newer, younger green trees on the left and the right of the stream channel in this footage. Now we're finally mm -hmm. getting back far enough to get away from the uh, uh, moderately forested area. Now it's looking more at the uh, clear cuts. So really everything you can see in this shot right here is perfectly illustrating what you're, what you're talking about. There's the valley goes up directly ahead of you here. There's a left fork and a right fork. Oh, no, it's, it changed, but um, that shows you directly where your drinking water comes from. Right. There's, there's no magical second spot. This is definitely it. Yeah. This is one of those forks, I think. Yeah, I can see the logging road off to the left. This would be the south fork is what I would refer to it. 
here. I'm going to give this about another minute and then we'll, um, you know, but keep talking if you'd like. Uh, there's only like another minute and a half left of it, but I think this is really informative to, to see what we're talking about. So thank you for narrating it. Keep narrating. I've never seen it before, so it's the first time for me too, watching huh. the footage. It's pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah. What we do as water district, we go into the watershed to observe what's happening in the watershed because the last way you want to find out about a mudslide is when it clogs the inlet to the water plant. Right. Um, so it's very interesting to see it all from a drone. So this is now the upper, the kind of the north fork right there. Right. And now looking back all the way down towards town. Troy, I had a question regarding the southern border of the watershed area. Is that, it was hard to see in the map on the line on the map. Is that border, that ridge line that's to the south end above Nesquin Creek, or is the ridge is the border of the actually in the Nesquin Creek drainage? It it defines the Nesquin Creek or Slab Creek drainage versus the Hawk right. Creek drainage. Okay, All right, and you can see it in that drone video. It's okay, the top of that ridge to your left. Nope, you're right on this one. Right. Sorry, camera keeps changing around. So. Um, so excuse my ignorance. So is it we refer to the Hawk Creek as our water capture area? Is it also fair to say that Nesquin Creek drainage is also water that we capture, or is a plant just in Nesquin Creek? Yeah, no, it, it's it's proper to say that Hawk Creek drains eventually into Nesquin Creek right in front of Proposal Rock. Right. Okay. Oops. Yes. <laughs> Understand now. Thank you. Um, I'll also take advantage of the uh, 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 transition here. Uh, Brenda, maybe we throw that map back up on the last slide just for a second. Um, and we'll be able to point out to people that uh, the, the upper watershed, the warehouser lands um, constitute on, on the order of, call it 1500 acres in round numbers that, that we're interested in. And that's the bulk of the watershed. Um, Are you seeing the map now, Alex? Did I do it right? Okay, yes. good. Yes, thank you. So again, to the, the, the two big parcels to the right in the uh, area bounded by the orange curve, those are actually the, the four parcels to the center and right, yeah. That constitutes the bulk of the uh, watershed, and it, it is, again, typically referred to as industrial forestry owned and managed. The other lots to the left and to the north are uh, just general, broadly defined as small woodland owners, um, and, and small can vary, but the point is, is that they're, they're typically slightly differently managed. Um, and then finally, the US Forest Service knob at the uh, southwest portion uh, is fairly unmanaged. It's, it's late, let for late successional reserve that Guy referred to. Just some round numbers on the, the ownership that you see. Great, well, well, thanks for that, Alex. And thanks for that video. That was pretty cool to see the, see the watershed like that. Um, just a little bit of perspective too in the watershed is that the watershed is about 1500 acres. And we're gonna talk with Phil Chick and Ben Hayes later about the Arch Cape watershed, but that relatively is the same size as the Arch Cape uh, drinking watershed too. So um, we're talking about really kind of similar size projects and scope. So that's pretty cool to see. Um, so again, um, I work with the North Coast Land Conservancy and, and really our role in this is to help lead the water district through the acquisition of the property. And so what I do for a living is acquisition of conservation properties. And so I wanna to talk today a little bit about the acquisition process and, and what can be expected as we move forward uh, with, the, with the project. And so um, we're pretty lucky that North Coast Land Conservancy has stepped into a situation working with the Nesquin 
regional water district that the water district has done a lot of this work up front because some of the most important work that we do is relationship building with landowners. I mean, and, and really when North Coast Land Conservancy does acquisitions, the only people that we work with are willing landowners. So we wanna work with people that want to do this type of work too and, and wanna sell their, sell their property willingly. And so that's always the approach that we've taken. And like I said, we're just lucky that the water district has formed relationships with a lot of the water or the property owners in the, di in the watershed. And, um, and so the next thing we wanna talk a little bit about is the funding sources to do that. Um, there are probably a handful of sources that the water district could look at in terms of funding. Uh, if you look at the, lots of those are either there's some state funding is through the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. And some of you might be familiar with some of that funding. It comes from state lottery dollars and that's really focused on habitat protection. Um, one of the one of the cool parts about this drinking watershed is just the, the habitat and the fish habitat within Hawk Creek. And I think that's an important selling point for this project too. Um, and so OWEB generally uh, funds acquisitions at about, at about $6 million over the biennium to, fu to fund acquisitions. And that's a program that North Coast Land Conservancy works with um, quite a bit. The other one that the Arch Cave Water District utilized I think to the tune of about $3 million was the, um, the Forest Legacy Program, and that's through the, the US Forest Service. And that's one of the advantages of the drinking watershed being owned by the water district is because it's a government entity that the water district's available for grants that say North Coast Land Conservancy isn't eligible to get. And so I would say those are probably the two biggest money options for the water district moving forward. Um, that's one of the roles that NCLC can play is, is leveraging those relationships we have with the grantors. So like I said, we've, we've worked with Forest Legacy, we've worked with OWEB, and just the ability to bring our expertise in grant writing and, and working through the due diligence with those. And I think the, as far as the due diligence, so like I said, the water district has done lots of the front end work with the landowner. So NCLC's expertise is really around the acquisition and really doing the due diligence. And what I mean by due diligence is really all the title work that goes into these, ensuring that the water district will get title to the property, that they will have legal and sufficient access to all the property that they're buying. Um, NCLC will help the water district coordinate appraisals, uh, purchase and sales agreements, you know, all of the, the nitty gritty of the land transactions, NCLC can help the water district uh, push some of that stuff forward. And so right now we're coordinating with the water district and uh, the water district has prioritized parcels within the watershed. And so now we're working with the water district and those landowners to try to move those opportunities forward and um, look at different funding sources to do that, which are the couple of funding sources I just talked about a little bit. Um, so I think that we're in a, the water district's in a pretty strong position just by the way of the amount of the work that they've done up front to get the project off the ground. And, and NCLC is fortunate to, to be able to step in and, and help at this point. Um, I think that gives you just a little bit of background with the acquisition. And I think if there's any questions later on in the question and answer section, um, feel free to ask any questions about um, how we go about doing some more of, of that work. Um, and then I think next up is just where are we at in the process with Alex and Guy? There we go. So um, I didn't uh, follow Brenda's instructions and give you uh, a bio on me because I know a number of folks here in town, but um, besides being a partner with Guy on our e-system services business, um, I ran our local watershed council for a while and we did watershed restoration work. But uh, one of the things I'm most proud of actually was serving on the board of the Nesco and Regional Water District for 20 years. Um, and it was an early fantasy of mine and the general manager at the time too, a guy Holsworth, that gosh, wouldn't it be cool if we could own our watershed? Um, and I grew up in an area where they, they the uh, again, somebody very graciously just gave the water district a bunch of land and uh, those things don't happen anymore. So we knew we'd have to buy it. Uh, so back 2011, 
uh, we hired a, a firm out of Corvallis that helps manage the Corvallis city water supply. Trout Mountain Forestry is a pretty well respected uh, forestry business, uh, and they're just one of many that can do this sort of work, as we're going to hear. But the the what they did is kind of a, a, a broad thumbs uh, uh, view of what roughly is the condition of the land and what does that mean in terms of land values, um, and what future management options would somebody who did own it for water supply consider. Uh, so that that was a very modest report was kind of an impetus to say, well, it's a lot of money, but um, uh, this is this is doable. Uh, since then, uh, the prior general manager and the current general manager, Troy, have done a really good job communicating with landowners about the district's interest and just keeping them in the loop. Uh, and at the same time, always looking for some opportunities to get some money. Uh, and further the task along. And that's where they hired Guy and I a few years back. Um, and so to get some of the things going, it, we, we get some money to uh, appraise some of the properties uh, that's underway. But really last year, 2021, in spite of the, the pandemic, uh, a lot of good things happened. Uh, and partnering with North Coast, uh, having them finish what is just a, a huge, huge uh, acquisition up in uh, in Clatsop County there uh, with Archcape and others and and um, getting them on board has been a very helpful thing. It, it alters the landscape a bit. Uh, I've, I've thrown out here a did you know, uh, John won't toot his horn probably, but you know the, the Conservancy already owns a few acres, uh, tens of acres in the Butte Creek watershed. So we had a question earlier about Nesquan Creek. That's the Southern watershed. Hawk Creek is here in the middle. Butte Creek uh, is north of Hawk Creek, and it actually also drains through the golf course uh, into Nesquan Creek. So they all drain into Nesquan Creek. Uh, anyway, since last year, we're also looking at ways to find some money to create a management plan because the district board is properly uh, aware of and concerned about saying, okay, once we get this land, how do we manage it? And, and how can we get some guidance? So uh, we are busily trying to find some funds to help get that underway. Uh, and again, when that happens, there will be more outreach to the public in terms of um, what do you think would be a good option or, or options, plural, for the district to do. So the uh, next strategy right now is especially, again, working with our friends at North Coast uh, and others is to uh, actually include a purchase of the first parcel, a first parcel, and perhaps even more, uh, but get things started. Uh, uh, definitely a toe in the water. And at the same time, uh, the district uh, staff board and, and others continue to have uh, discussions with all the landowners in the basin. Uh, what we didn't mention is, is that Weyerhaeuser is a relatively new owner. They actually only acquired the land that we're talking about in 2021. Uh, and prior to that, it was with Hancock Forest Management. And again, we had very good relations with them, talking to them about possibly selling. Um, so, uh, that won't go away. It's a very small uh, world in the industrial forestry world. And so having at least some good relations with the prior owners should help us uh, moving forward with the current owners. One other thing I want to add uh, to what Alex has said into a little bit of the timeline is that uh, the Water District Board uh, has has uh, done a lot of work on this and, and to uh, become more knowledgeable about uh, what their options are. And I know that in the past, especially after the 2016 source water area assessment that DEQ did, uh, the Water District Board uh, had invited in uh, drinking water specialists from DEQ to talk about their options, talk about the impact, impact of uh, what an industrial timber operation does to water quality and quantity versus what other kind of management could be. So. Uh, this has been something that, you know, they've been looking at, they've been talking to experts uh, about this, um, and uh, over, especially over the last uh, five or six years. Excellent. All right, are we ready to move on? Um, this is the what's happening now. I think we're back to you, John. Yeah, thanks, Brenda. Um, so what is happening now? The North Coast Land Conservancy is, is working with the Water District right now. 
we've looked at a, to prioritize the parcels within the watershed because the district has a has twenty five thousand dollar grant that can go towards appraising the properties, and so we looked at prioritizing which parcels would uh, one working with the willing landowner and two um, would have the most benefit to the drinking watershed, and so um, we. Troy did that for me, and now we're working with an appraiser to appraise as many of those properties as we can. Um, we have a we have a couple willing sellers now that are are willing to move forward with the acquisition. So um, we the water district has received about sixty thousand dollars in donations, and and NCLC is pursuing is pursuing grants to to help fill the gap because really what we're trying to do is buy that first forty acre parcel to really get the ball rolling. And uh, we feel pretty confident that, you know, we can fill that 40 acre gap, you know, within the next, hopefully next couple months and really get the ball rolling on acquisition of the first piece. Okay, thank you. And so now this is the, uh, the next slide, next steps. This is the opportunity for any, anyone from the water district who happens to be here. I'm a board member and also Troy to say, okay, well, Given all that, you know, what are our long-term goals? What are our focus? So I'll just say as a board member, uh, I'm interested in seeing uh, this go through as, in, in the way that's most wise and most thoughtful. And I think we have an excellent team. Um, I'm very excited that we're partnered with um, John Wickersham and the North Coast Land Conservancy. I think there's a lot of good uh, possibilities for the future. As a board member, I will think thoughtfully about each and every step and all the information that is brought to me. But um, I think as the informational town hall coordinator, it's important that um, the community knows about this. And so my, I think my biggest role here is to help just keep bringing this information forward and finding ways to get information back from the community. So that is my focus, but I'd like to to see if Troy has any thoughts and if there's any other board members who happen to be here, um, please, please pick up after Troy, but Troy, go ahead and I'm popcorning it to you. Okay. Well, um, as for long term goals, uh, I view the watershed. Well, as the person who, you know, keeps the water in the faucets and drinkable, I view it as a part of our machine that we use to make drinking water. And it's very important that we do the maintenance that's necessary on the machine that we currently use to filter our drinking water to make sure that in the future it can continue to do the job, maybe even improve the current situation in the watershed to allow for better storage and uh, less need for filtration. And that kind of ties into, um, you know, any enterprise needs to keep uh, functioning at a certain level, just like the water district needs to. And the amount of money that it will take the water district to go about doing things besides protecting the watershed to make up the difference of the watershed not being in the pristine condition is going to get more and more expensive in the future um, and is already quite expensive. So just fiscally for the water districts benefit. I, I also try to think of it that way as well, which is it's going to be a lot less expensive for the people of Nesquin that use Nesquin Water District to protect the watershed than it's going to be to build, let's say, a desalinization plant to pull water in, to build another treatment plant to be on a different watershed that may or may not suffer the same fate. Um, just as a maintenance man at heart, I, I, I think it's a great idea to maintain what we currently have and improve. And that's the way I see the long-term goals 
as far as management is concerned of the water district. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. And yeah, anyone else want to comment on long term goals or strategy guide? Did you have, were you going to say something? Sorry, anyone? Any presenters? I mean, all right. So we will go to the I next. Think, go ahead. Well, well, Brenda, I just want to add that, that uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, drives all this is, is uh, what the cost would be otherwise. So Troy just mentioned about how he has to process water and, uh, and the filtration systems that he has to use, uh, how he has to shut down when uh, somebody is spraying up, uh, up above in the watershed, or if there's a landslide or a mudslide of some sort that blocks his water. Uh, if he gets a lot of sediment in the water, would it, you know, is he even capable of processing the water with uh, a lot of sediment in the water? Um, there are ways to do that. And if you had uh, a plant that could handle some of those things, and if you had the money to pay to how to, to filter and, um, uh, and clean the water, but um, it's, just, it's just out of reach uh, for us. Uh, so it's a kind of a cost benefit thing. And, uh, you know, I think that's, it, it's something, it, 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 and it's the same thing with the water uh, quantity. You know, I guess it's always possible for Neskowin to build a dam on the upper Hawk Creek and somehow get permission to do that. It oh, seems that in Oregon, people are tearing down dams. Uh, and how you would do possibly do that uh, to hold back water for us to be able to use it when we need it. Um, I mean, it's just cost prohibitive and, uh, and probably also permit prohibitive too. So when you look at it, owning and managing the land is the most cost effective way of protecting our water. Uh, and it, it really is just really boils down to that cost benefit analysis. To use jargon. Uh, all right, thank you, thank you. Good, good summary. So let's get on to next steps for the community. This was um, great information. So now I'm gonna ask uh, Ran if you would just make some tie-ins with our community and what community members can do. And uh, we're going to get to this slide. And remember, we still have the um, couple slides, and then we're going to hear from Arch Cape and how they did it. And then we have Q and A. So there's still a lot more to come. <laughs> but in case you're curious about what you can do for next steps, uh, Rand, do you want to start with this? Are you there? His mute's on. Moran, your mute's on. Anyway, okay. Um, well, I will talk a little bit about um, next steps. And one thing is that I encourage you to stay informed, um, particularly uh, the, Nesk the Nesquin Regional Water District is um, beginning an email list. Uh, for anyone who is here who wants information, particularly about the watershed acquisition, please um, email nrwd at nesquinwater.com and request to be added on the info list for this. Also, following um, this town hall um, in the next few days, uh, probably sometime early next week, a survey is going to go out to anyone who attended. Um, so we ask that you participate in that survey. And also there will be future community surveys about this and other topics. Um, make sure you please put your voice in there as well as attend the town halls. Q&A will be coming up. There's other things you can do as well. Um, if you have any time, energy or expertise in this area, you can email the same um, water district, uh, nrwd at nesmanwater.com and let us know. Uh, if you want to help with any fundraising ideas, 
And in a moment, we have a slide. Um, if you want to directly donate to this fund, you can do that as well. Rand, did you come online? Because we wanted to hear from you. Is he not here? He's here. He's here. I saw him drop off and then he rejoined. But okay. he's still on he's still on mute. All right. Well then let me go to the next slide and maybe he'll come back um, and he can help with the uh, Q and A at the end as well. If you have any interest in donating to the current efforts, as John was mentioning, um, we are looking at acquiring a, a parcel of the watershed. We have $60,000 already raised. So if you wanna contribute that and you have any inclination to donate, you can go to the North Coast Land Conservancy Trust website um, and do so and make sure that you just put for Nesquin watershed project in the information box. And can I uh, add a couple couple words here too, Brenda? Yes, please. Is um, one is that NCLC is a is a nonprofit, so there are uh, tax benefits to donating to NCLC. The all the money that is donated to NCLC and tagged for the watershed project, a hundred percent of that money goes to the watershed project. None of that money is retained by NCLC to pay staff or overhead. 100% of those dollars go to the watershed. So I just wanted to point that out. Excellent. I think that's great and important. Okay. So now uh, we're, going, we're going to go to section B. I, I do know that there might be some questions. If there are, um, we will get to those. But I would like to hear from those, who, I think it's important to hear from those who have gone before us. And we have uh, Phil Chick and Ben Hayes who have had experience um, working with North Coast also Land Conservancy on their watershed acquisition. So um, I'd like to invite you gentlemen to, to share your story. All right. Well, I uh, I guess I'll start uh, if that's okay, Ben. Wherever you are out there, um, I'll talk about maybe the the fluffier stuff, and you could hit the technical aspects. But uh, again, my name is Phil Chick. I'm the manager for Arch Cape Domestic Water Supply District. We're just up the road from you, uh, about an hour or so by the tunnel. If you've ever driven through the tunnel on the highway, then you've driven through Arch Cape. Just to answer a few uh, of the main questions here, um, you know, I, I recognize where you all are right now. We were there about five years ago and just getting all the people together and trying to develop the questions. Um, that seemed to be a really big part of this and a hard part of this initially. And I got to say, I'm really impressed. You've got great momentum going on so far and you're way further along than I knew. So great job there. Um, I think for Arch Cape, the driving focus, the motivation for us was to try to maintain drinking water quality and quantity. Um, the ultimate goal, of course, was to do this in a way where we could establish a community forest that uh, was owned by the community, um, local control by the people that lived there and drank the water and, and lived near the forest, um, creating a forest that was capable of celebrating the spirit of recreation and conservation and clean water and forestry, all those things um, right in Arch Cape. So again, it's a uh, it's a goal of a holistic approach to drinking water quality, quantity, drinking water protection. Uh, timber activity is something that we uh, knew a lot about in Arch Cape. It sounds like you folks do too. Over the last decade, um, our watershed was greatly defined by uh, timber management activity, by some industrial timber uh, property managers that have been around for a while and historically had some intensive harvests in the area. And I think Guy, you said it well in the beginning, um, 
you know, industrial forestry can happen in, in drinking water sheds, but it poses challenges and their goals aren't domestic water supply district goals. Um, they're, they're two competing interests and, and as good a job as they try to do. And there are people that um, have a lot of care in what they do in that industry. Um, it, it's still different goals and endpoints you're going for. And you don't always get where you need to be. So if highest motivation for our group, for, for Arch Cape, was the idea of acquiring the property and enabling the community to make decisions about it which has such a major influence on people's lives, uh, their way of life, water supply, all of that. Um, boy, where else can I go? Um, that's kind of the motivation story behind it. Uh, Troy talked a little bit about this being a natural infrastructure project for Nescoem. That was an approach that we took as well. Uh, we all know that when you own a, a water supply district, you have to take what you get and you have to make it great. You have to make it palatable, affordable, clean, and safe. And you have to make infrastructure upgrades along the way. In Arch Cape, we thought that, you know, a way to go about doing this was to look at this as an infrastructure upgrade. Our infrastructure wasn't just what we had under the ground, but it was in the forest, in the stands of hemlock and spruce and cedar that was out there. Um, it was more of a, a proactive approach to drinking water protection rather than a reactive. You can, you can uh, try to protect your water in a, in a couple different ways, either through uh, engineering principles or through source water protection. Again, uh, in 2010, we built a new plant for about a million dollars. I think that was kind of a reactive way to go about doing it. We were trying to, uh, to meet state drinking water standards. We were bombing our tests constantly, our annual uh, disinfection byproducts tests. So in 2017, when this opportunity came along to work with North Coast Lent, Conservancy and Sustainable Northwest and possibly purchase this property, uh, we jumped on it. We saw it as a proactive approach to doing that. Um, and I'd, I'd be happy to uh, stop talking now and, and, and let uh, Ben add some things. Um, he, he's been a great help for us um, as a forester in this process. North Coast Land Conservancy, Springboard Forestry, Sustainable Northwest have all been fantastic and we couldn't have done it without them. Well, Bill, you covered so many of the bases, there's not a whole lot left uh, <laughs> left to cover, but I'll sort of maybe jump in. So Phil really talked about that, like how do you buy a watershed and why would you wanna buy a watershed? Um, Alex and Guy also covered that, I think really articulately earlier. And so that's kind of the stage that um, you guys are at and that's something that I work on, uh, my background is in forestry and finance, particularly focused on uh, drinking water and silviculture for sort of forest restoration activities. And I'm based in Timber, Oregon, so not that far from Arch Cape. Um, a lot of times though, you end up, I guess, owning a watershed and then you're like, okay, so what now? We have this new piece of infrastructure, what do we do with it going forward? And that's often where we come in is we can help um, with the both planning process and execution. And the way that I like to think about it and that we've worked with uh, Phil and others in Arch Cape to think about it is to say, how do you manage in a manner where this property and this forest is more able to provide reliable quantities of high quality water a hundred years from now? And so are there things that are sort of down cycle that would lead a forest to generate either less water or lower quality water, or that would have ecological risk associated with them? And are there management choices and plans you can make that would be sort of up cycle? So improve the future condition of water or just decrease the risk of some sort of catastrophic uh, water event. And so that ranges from Kind of if, if you think of it as a piece of infrastructure, which is a really good way, I think, to think about it for a municipality, 
from your road system. That's kind of traditional infrastructure. Roads are a considerable issue when it comes particularly to fine sediment contribution and water filtration. Most systems on the coast are very sensitive to the really fine sediments and turbidity issues. Um, to a catastrophic road failure, that's something where you could have untreatable water for an extended period of time. And unfortunately, a lot of our communities have had to deal with that, both from logging roads and from other road systems. And then also to kind of a bigger picture, and this was discussed a little bit earlier around kind of ecological resilience. So if this is green infrastructure, how do you generate conditions that are able to bounce back from a disturbance? And that disturbance may be an exogenous disturbance. It might be something like a windstorm that's kind of outside of our control, or maybe endogenous. So it may be somebody coming into the watershed and doing something that could be uh, the board deciding that it wanted to do a logging project. Is the disturbance generated by that kind of worth the future increase in resilience uh, or is it not? And so these are the trade-off analyses that we can help think through. And it ranges from a very qualitative kind of in the case of Arch Cape set of conversations. So bringing people together, having conversations about what matters, what are the values of this community? What's the scientific basis for that? And how do we move forward to really very quantitative? So how do we use what's called a growth and yield model? So models that can predict future forest conditions. Uh, we use rainflow runoff models. So models that are able to take in what we call a raster or a bunch of pixels with different forest conditions in them different slopes, different so, uh, soils, and then estimate both runoff and sediment contribution to the watershed. So we can combine these really qualitative things. So the conversations, the relationships, the quantitative modeling and kind of scientific understanding of best practices or modern practices in forestry with the financial realities of a small uh, municipality or unincorporated uh, municipal or unincorporated drinking water owner. And this can range from private companies to uh, groups like the ones that we've kind of covered today. So as we bring those three together, we end up with a plan. And then in most cases, it's our role to figure out, okay, hey, can, is this something that we could actually implement? And that's often uh, something that has to be kind of negotiated back and forth a little bit. And then B, if we are gonna implement it, um, kind of how do we go about doing that? And so that's the stage we're at right now with Arch Cape. So we've gone through a management planning process. We still have, as I think many of you'd probably realize in a acquisition, you have a bunch that is under a non-disclosure agreement. So lots of that information can't be shared until you actually own the property. So we have a draft management plan. It's available on Arch Cape Forest's website or Arch Cape Water District's website. Um, and that will be kind of finished up following acquisition. Another one, if folks are interested, is uh, I've worked for the city of Astoria for a long time. They own a fairly large watershed, the Bear Creek watershed, and they also have a management plan posted on their website that we wrote. And then if you look at uh, Sustainable Northwest's website, I believe they have a fairly good catalog of forest management plans associated with community forests, some of which are municipal drinking watersheds some of which aren't, and also have a whole range of different values from public access to um, some properties that have zero public access. So there are lots of uh, kind of contributing factors to think about as you say, okay, now we have this piece of infrastructure, what are we gonna do with it? So maybe I'll pause there and um, kind of hand it back to the moderators. Well, thank you so much, that was, I, I wish I had a better word than awesome, but that was awesome. <laughs> I love that story because it, it um, thank you, Phil and Ben. Um, you really helped us see like the light at the end of the tunnel, uh, where we might be going. Um, and just to, so, th so thank you. Um, does anyone else want to comment? Any of the presenters want to comment before we open it up to Q&A? So I'm just going to keep the microphone any presenters want to do some final comments because the next next thing is open q and a i'll make i'll make one quick comment and uh, thanks ben and phil that was that was great um just in one difference between the, the one of probably many differences between the acquisition in nesquin and arch cape and and one that 
we'll have to figure out together is that Nesquin has, I don't know, maybe a handful of landowners, which makes this a little bit more difficult than Arch Cape. Arch Cape bought their whole watershed from one owner. And so that makes it all just a little bit more tricky as we go forward. But I just wanted to, to point that out um, as a little bit of a, a difference between these two. Yeah, and I see that it's probably like a bit, an opportunity and, and maybe a challenge because on the one hand, it's an opportunity because there's sm maybe smaller lots. On the other hand, it's a challenge because it's more people, right? So, so it's me. I don't know where the pluses minuses draw, but that's the hand we've been dealt. Right? <laughs> so, you know, speaking of that, you know, some of the questions might be, I don't know how much can be shared, you know, about the current potentialities about that. I mean, um, there were some questions about how far are we along on acquiring any um, particular parcel. I don't know if you can share anything about that, John. And then I also see a couple other questions, but why don't, why don't we see, um, I'd like to help field that question. I mean, if there's willing sellers, how far are we along and what, what can be shared with the public? Yeah, and I'll, I'll leave some of that up to, to Troy because he's talked with the, with the landowners, but um, so far NCLC has $60,000 towards the acquisition of the first piece, which is about a 40 acre piece um, owned by a private landowner. And we're currently working on, we need to get a letter of intent um, re-signed. The, the district had, had one previously and we need just to, to update that. Um, I would say that we're more than halfway um, towards the acquisition of the first piece, but there is still a lot, um, a lot more parcels that, that we would need to acquire and a lot more money we would need to raise. So um, just like to point point that out, even though the first part, first piece we feel pretty good about, we still need to raise money for it. John, I may want to uh, add in here too. Um, you know, we spent a couple of years talking with Hancock uh, Forest Management folks. And, uh, uh, you know, when you're dealing with a, a company like Hancock, I mean, they're a management company, they, they're running a, a, a real estate investment trust. Um, and so there's all kinds of uh, complications with that when they sell uh, land. Uh, but we made a lot of inroads uh, with Hancock. And uh, unfortunately, right before they transferred, uh, entered into with Weyerhaeuser, a major uh, uh, transfer of lands between the, each company, um, you know, they were uh, very serious about uh, selling uh, that piece within the uh, within the Hawk Creek watershed. Uh, we need to work on strategies with Weyerhaeuser. Weyerhaeuser is a, a different animal, so to speak, and uh, not sure where this particular parcel sits within their structure. Uh, that's something we need to find out uh, before we can develop a strategy, but that's going to be uh, a target for us as we move forward, and I think we can, you know, working with you, John, and others will um, have to lay that out, but uh, certainly that's a, a major target for us. And it's too bad that the transfer happened. Uh, it's kind of a shock to all of us, but um, we'll just get back at it again because it's a critical piece. And okay. I I oh, sorry, sorry, Brenda. Uh, I'll just add that NCLC too. We just we just closed on the Rainforest Reserve, which is in Clatsop County, and, and part of that project we worked pretty closely with Warehouser. Um, so. We do, we have worked with warehouse in the past and we plan to work with them more in the future and on, on this project too. So um, so we'll see where it goes. And, and Peter asked a question about um, parcels and what did they pay? And, and sometimes it's hard to pull these deals apart because really they, they buy thousands of acres at a time and they're, they're kind of all over the place. So sometimes it's hard to pull these things apart and get a per acre value exactly for these, right. for these pieces. Um, but I don't know. I mean, Ben, Ben might have the best idea of maybe what, what like well, a we talk, average per acre value or something would be if you ever wanted to go there. Yeah, John, we, in talking with the Hancock folks after the transfer, I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of acres were transferred back and forth. I mean, you, there's just no way in that transfer, you'd be able to pull out the, what the value of the land in Hawk Creek would be. Um, 
as you know, uh, and Ben knows too, that uh, industrial timber folks do this all the time to consolidate where they're working or whatever. And and uh, and also Hancock is being, again, managing lands for trust. Uh, uh, they have different, different uh, financial things motivating them when they transfer lands like this. So we were pretty close with the Hancock folks. Um, and so we'll, uh, after, uh, as we move forward, John, uh, to work with, uh, with you and Anna on approaches to Weyerhaeuser. Uh, Alex and I worked with Weyerhaeuser uh, in the Valley uh, a couple of years ago on uh, source water protection. And, uh, and as you know, they were also involved in the Trask River study and, and other things. I mean, they, they're willing, you know, and interested to, interest to talk uh, about this and uh, we'll just kind of see where this goes, so. Okay, so thank you. Um, a couple more questions have come forward. One is who's hey, Brenda, before we get to the questions, Ram yeah. um, pinged us and said he's ready to go. Yeah, but I thought, okay, but can we, why don't we, I think we can have him do his message as a wrap up. Okay, great. Yeah, I think it'll go nicely. So Rand has something to wrap up. He was going to say something in the, and how the community can be involved. So Rand, I'm going to ask you because we, we've got some hot questions here and people are asking who's the moderator. I want to make sure that you know that I am. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to some of the earlier questions. So Jean Cameron asked a couple questions. Um, I don't know if we have those answers to those questions. Um, I think one is, has the board considered a, a bond measure to pay for the acquisition? And I can't speak for anything um, on the current board, but maybe, uh, maybe John, you can talk about experience with that. Have communities used bond measures um, to yeah. to fund to raise funds? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Brendan. Maybe if Phil's around, I'd kick this to Phil because the Arch Cape Water District, I think, kicked this around as an idea. Um, and maybe Phil, you could talk about the, you know, maybe just your thought process around around that. Maybe why you decided not to do it or not do it yet. Sure, um, great question. We wrestled with that. Our board wrestled with that for boy, um, well over a year. And what it came down to is is we uh, we tried to take an approach to not put any financial burden on the ratepayers of any kind. And so what really helped us out in the end was getting a, uh, a ARPA grant through Business Oregon, American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, we received about $2 million recently. And uh, that sort of made us revamp our whole levy idea. It just, it didn't really pan out. It wasn't gonna be necessary for acquisition or even in the early years of acquisition for maintenance and stewardship of the land. But it definitely is an option when we're looking at it. Um, I'm not sure how big the Nesquin tax base is. In Arch Cape, we've got about 330 homes and we're looking at generating about 60,000 a year for 10 years and a 10 year levy. And again, that was, you say levy, and, and sometimes that really, <laughs> that'll bring people out. Um, they don't want to get taxed. There's some people that are very much in favor of it, but others, you know, pff, that's a deal killer right off. So I would probably recommend on, on researching that, but maybe putting it uh, on the back burner. Any other comments on that, on the bond um, matter? Um, okay, I'm just so you know, as the moderator, I'm gonna ask the questions in order asks, right? So post your questions, I'll get to them in the order posted. So the next question was also from Jean Cameron and she wanted to know, um, is there, does the management plan include a focus on wildlife um, prevention, maybe that meant protection. And does anyone want to comment? Maybe that's for you, Ben. Um, how do you protect wildlife when you when you think about managing your forest? Yeah, so um, well, that's, a, 
wildfire. So um, that's a good question. And it kind of factors into this larger question of how do we manage in a way that's going to be resilient in the face of some big disturbance. And so really common disturbance is fire and it's increasingly common. Uh, challenge in west side forests and particularly coastal forests is that the historic fire regime, so if we look backwards, the historic fire regime is for uh, long return intervals, so hundreds of years between fires and fires that are kind of stand replacing. So even if you're managing and thinning and kind of doing all the right things, these fires when they come through, and we saw this in the fires in the Western Cascades two years ago, have enough kind of oomph and power and the conditions are extreme enough where your management doesn't make a difference historically. So that's looking backwards. Looking forwards, we know that the climate is changing. I think we're just beginning to see the impacts of that on fire behavior on the West side. And so folks are starting to ask questions around kind of does forest management on the west side have a greater ability to either prevent wildfire, it's unlikely that it would actually prevent it. It's more likely that you would have greater ecological resilience as a result of your management that allowed that watershed to still have some forest structure, some ability to filter water, some ability to provide reliable base flows for municipal drinking. Um, and that's really kind of the focus of management plans. And that I would assume if you acquire this and go through a management plan, any forester today will be kind of asking those questions in the plan. Great, any other comments on wildfire prevention? The next question is about um, federal funding available for acquisition. I think there was, there was a mention earlier about that, who John, maybe you would know, or other folks. Um, uh, is there federal funding available for acquisition and management through, well, specific question about the 2021 infrastructure bill, but I guess it could be from anywhere if it exists. I don't know of any. I, I can't say that I've necessarily looked at this point either. So, I mean, someone else might know more than, than me. I can just say, speaking as a board member, we will look at multiple sources of funding continuously until the acquisition is complete, which might take decades. I can, I can jump in a little bit because we work across a whole bunch of different project types, is that across the board, there is a whole mix, and we call it kind of like a, a layer cake of funding. So it's everything from NRCS funding for management to USDA forest legacy grants for acquisition to state funding to uh, individual allocations. So there is sort of a layer cake approach. And I think this is what both John and Brenda were getting to a uh, whole mix of fundings and the infrastructure bill and uh, current administration have dramatically increased the availability of funding for this type of project. Land acquisition has historically been on this sort of fine line between infrastructure investment and like forest acquisition and conservation. And so um, that's something that is currently being reviewed within the US. Any other comments on funding sources? Yeah, I would just say thanks for that, Ben, too. Yeah, and, and if, you know, generally looking at funding sources, like Ben is talking, stacking funding sources, you know, most likely we're gonna to have to have a, a handful of funding sources to make this thing work, right? It won't be just one big funding source. So yeah, we'll be out there constantly looking for different funding sources and how do they match up and how do they work together? So that's. Okay, any, any other thoughts on funding sources? Phil. I would add on funding that you might want to consider um, funding for for technical guidance, things like outreach. We use some of that. Oregon DEQ has some programs for um, for technical assistance that we've used. Um, there's going to come a point in time when your board and your staff can't do all this, and you might have to hire out for some things and those resources are there to help build capacity. Excellent, thanks. Any other comments on funding? Okay, so that's an ongoing conversation we will have as a community. 
Um, the next question I think was addressed, but uh, about what did Weyerhaeuser pay? And if I heard correctly, someone said it was hard to calculate because of all the different, who, who answered that kind of? I did, uh, okay. Brendan, this guy. Yeah, it, it was a massive land swap with Hancock. And so hundreds of thousands of acres were, were exchanged between the two. And you wouldn't be, you know, there was, it's not like Weyerhaeuser, you know, paid money for that property. They just swap lands, and so it would be impossible to come up with a with a number. I mean, they have ways, obviously, of valuing land uh, in these in these exchanges, uh, but it wouldn't really help us. So that's complicated. Um, but let's move on to the, this next question. is very answerable. What what is the total land acquisition that we're looking at in acres? And I guess that depends on how much of the watershed source we want to acquire, right? So I don't know if Alex or Troy wants to talk about yeah. this. Troy? Alex? Alex? You, Troy. <laughs> All right, you, I'll Troy. This one. I'm going to make it short and sweet. So as far as I can figure, the total acreage is 1,542 acres. Um, the estimated total monies uh, if you considered mean forest prices in the state of Oregon right now, it would be around $6 million roughly to own the entire watershed. That's every acre that we can figure is within the source water area of the watershed. And who's the moderator slash point person leading this task? Um, well, I, I work at the behest of the water board and the water board makes the decisions for the Nesquim Regional Water District. So in a way, I think that would be me. Um, and what's the hierarchy of needs for this project? Um, I would say good communication with the sellers of land in the watershed and money to purchase the watershed, pretty simple. Um, the better we do at those two things, the quicker and smoother this will, will go. I think that's my best answer for Michael. Yeah. Great, thanks. Any other comments on those questions? Uh, those Can I, uh, comments? Brenda? Yeah. This, this is Guy. It's, it is, I, have a, I have a question for Ben. Uh, so do you, uh, as, as we appraise these lands and even as, and even the warehouser lands, uh, what impact do you think that these new private forest accords will have on the value of some of this land, especially in these uh, very narrow uh, watersheds, canyons, areas, uh, steep slopes, those kinds of things that are fish streams that are fish bearing. We've got, Hawk Creek being uh, ESA listed stream. Uh, is there a, a reason that that uh, any water district or anybody purchasing lands would want to wait until uh, these new accords are, are approved? I think it's by the end of the year that they've set the deadline for the new accords to be uh, uh, put in uh, for the rulemaking to happen in the state legislature. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, that's a good question. I have lots of thoughts, probably more than should be shared on this uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Zoom meeting. But at very broad terms, so for folks who aren't familiar with it, um, and there are people in this uh, Zoom who are far more familiar with it than I am, so they should jump in if they feel so inclined. But uh, it would be a strengthening of Oregon's force practices laws as negotiated um, through an extended process. And in very practical terms, we have not seen it reflected in appraisals yet. Um, we've brought it up with numerous appraisers uh, in the state and they have not used the new stream proposed stream buffer rules. And that's the place where it would have the most practical impact as it would basically mean you could cut slightly less of your forest land. Um, we have those seen over the past 
10 years a lower interest in institutional investment in Oregon than in Washington because there's regulatory certainty in Washington and not so much in Oregon. And so I think what we're likely to see is just kind of an extension of sales out to push the closings to a point where you would have more regulatory certainty following a completed update of the Oregon Forest Practices Act. So um, at this point, though, on a property like yours, it's unlikely, I think, to make a really significant difference in value. It's going to be making that biggest difference in value on larger acquisitions, um, and particularly ones that have very large amounts of stream or steep slope exposure. I was thinking of more of the warehouser. I mean, in the smaller wood lots, you're right. Uh, the warehouser property might be uh, interesting to see how once we get the we've been told by DEQ that there's that ODF and ODF and W are going to be doing some serious <laughs> map making over the next six months uh, to see where these overlays go. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how the new rules impact the Hawk Creek watershed and in particular the, the warehouser property because um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of steep slopes and not sure how far up, the, you know, we've got salmon and other fish. So Anyways, thanks, Ben. Okay, great. There's a few more questions. Um, so that was that one. And then the additional questions. This one might be for not one of our panelists, but I don't know, maybe Sarah. Um, is there any impact on permitting of new homes because of watershed limits? Anyone want to field that question? Roy? I, yeah, I can. Um, so no, not at the moment. There's no impact on permitting of new homes because of a lack of water that would keep that from happening. Um, mainly what you're going to see as far as limits on size due to constraints of water from our watershed uh, will come up sooner or later. Uh, it's kind of hard to predict how many houses will be built and at what time. Um, and that would be in restrictions and ability to deliver water. So we would be talking um, the annexation of new properties, large subdivisions. At the moment, the building seems to be one or two single family homes here and there. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question good enough, but that is the answer I know. Uh, not hey. at the moment. Thank you, Troy. No any other comments on that? Not hearing any. The next question comes to it's more of a comment. Maybe it's a question um, about having capital ready when a willing seller comes forward, uh, which is you know what we're trying to do with the the funding with North. North Coast, maybe John wants to speak to this. Um, but short of a bond measure, uh, the, Charlie's asking, you know, I guess how, what is other fundraising ways to pursue so we can take advantage of uh, opportunities when they arise? I think that's the question. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think some of the question even referred to EcoTrust Forest Management as who uh, NCLC used to as a bridge owner, and you know EFM was a was a was a great partner to work with. But there are definitely advantages and disadvantages um, to going that route. And at this point for this project, I would say uh, there's probably more advantages to to not going through the same type of route that we did and just trying to raise money as we go to buy properties. Um, I think, you know, when we open up talks with Warehouser, if, if they're amenable to that, um, you know, those can those can go, you know, a year or two, I think, you know, and still be comfortable within Warehouser's timeframe. Um, and whereas they could even go longer with, uh, with individual small lot landowners. So at this time, I don't see that that, that being too much of a benefit, um, but it is always an option. And so, and like we talked about earlier, I don't think we want to take anything off the table, but um, but there are costs associated with it, and and they can be steep. <laughs> you know, um, 
and, and Jean Cameron, who's online, I think would remember this um, uh, when she was on the water board as president. Um, the, the district uh, explored uh, potential uh, loans from uh, a couple of banks who were interested. And this is, of course, at a time when money was really, really cheap. Uh, banks were looking for a place to, to park their funds. Uh, they had presentation, the district board had presentations from the Oregon Coast Community Bank, uh, which was probably the number one bank that was very interested in participating in, in a coastal community project. Uh, so I think there's, uh, there are options. I mean, of course, that would get back to having a bond to pay off a loan, those kinds of things. Uh, but there are banks and interest rates are still good that are interested, especially someone like Oregon Coast Community Bank uh, that are interested in local projects like this. Okay, any other comments, questions, thoughts? Okay. Okay, Ran, it looks like you're unmuted now. Do you want to say? <laughs> oh, wait, we can't hear you. But you're unmuted. Ran had some closing comments. Maybe yeah. on your microphone. He's got some technical issues that he's dealing with. Okay. Okay, I think that might oh, have just- we can hear you now, wait. Okay. All right, thank you. So <laughs> I think I had my auxiliary speaker plugged in and that took away my mute, unmute. So a basic tenant of our existence daily is that we all need love, food, and water. This work is to secure one third of that equation in our community into the future. It's critical that the Nesquan community express its understanding of and support of the Nesquan Regional Water District for the watershed acquisition. That understanding of and support for Nesquan's watershed acquisition can be manifest by participating in the district surveys that they will put out speaking to your neighbors about your understanding and support of the watershed acquisition, voicing your support through individual letters of support to the district and letters to newspapers, organizing your HOA to send a letter of support to the district and providing donations in any amount that express your support to the North Coast Land Trust uh, land Conservancy, excuse me, uh, through the Nes and make sure you note the Nesco and Watershed Project. Please take the time to have your questions answered and develop an understanding of the watershed acquisition so you can make an informed decision and support the effort. That's my wrap up. Thank you. Excellent wrap up. I think we can close. This evening, Chris, if you want to stop the recording, that makes a nice end. All right, so thank you, everyone.